You have to lock the door. There are so many immigrants in this neighborhood now. Salam alaikum. I'm sorry, who is this gentleman? Uh, sorry, this is my uncle Nassim, and I didn't know that he was coming. I, I, I did not invite him. He's my brother. Pleasure to meet you, brother. Rami speaks to you often, mashallah. He speaks Arabic, too. Nassim. What prison did you convert in? <laughs> Holy shit. That was a scene from Rami, season two on Hulu, with Laith Nakhli and Mahershala Ali. Man, welcome to Saudi Arabia. I sat down with Laith last week and we discussed Rami, the new season. We discussed America, fucking everything. Spoiler alert though. Welcome. That's so cool, man. So what, did you watch, like, were the episodes censored in Jordan? Uh, I don't know if they're censored in Jordan. You know, the funny thing is the uh, Hulu doesn't work outside the U.S. It's like HBO. Right, it's, right. it's geo-restricted. Yeah. So what happens is you either have to sign up for this network called OSN, and I think you did a promo for them. Yeah. So OSN, they have the license to air yeah. Hulu. So you watch the whole thing. That's good because, you know, I know the OSN thing. I don't know how they're going to edit mine because mine hasn't aired yet on the OSN because um, I haven't received the hate yet from there. But um, huh. <laughs> it is. Uh, but they aired, I think, the first four episodes. And I know yeah. some of the scenes were edited. This whole geo-restricting thing is annoying. Like Amazon Prime is bullshit in the Middle East. There's almost nothing on it. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, you know, it's opening up slowly. You know, where they're going to... Yeah. Uh, yeah. I like your, your still, uh, your Syrian accent is uh, pretty prominent. Shami, Shami. And also, Mawlud can be Britannia. Okay. Mawlud be Britannia. And when I was 10 years old, I was in Syria. And I didn't speak Arabic at all. What a kill me. I endured three years of bullying and, and crap until I spoke Arabic. But then, I was never bullied again, ever. Wow. And... Uh, so you were an adult uh, when you arrived in the U.S.? I'm, I just turned 20, yeah. I met you briefly in 03, and I've seen most of the Arab American Comedy Festival shows from 16 years ago, 17 years ago. Yeah, did you watch like uh, the infamous like ones like uh, Zuberman? Yeah. <laughs> You know, I've been looking for those to rewatch. I know they were recorded somewhere. I'll be damned if I can watch one of those. It'll be great. I remember like when we did Zipperman. I remember walking out. Basically, for those who don't know, Zipperman was, uh, he was like a superhero, the Arab superhero, you know. <laughs> I had this cape on and maybe I'll send you a picture. I have a picture if you wanted to add any pictures in there, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Please do. Let's, uh, we'll and post those immediately. <laughs> I'll, have that, I'll have that picture if you can, when, we, when I mentioned Zipperman, you can put it in it. So anyway. <laughs> He had like a coffee pot on the side and he had a little mini ergile. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Whenever someone was in distress, Zuberman would show up. <laughs> he'd give him the yeah, yeah. a bit of like to pull the ergile. I remember you saying in this white woman in distress and during Christmas <laughs> because it was very slow for Zuberman. So I go <laughs> on a holiday. So. Oh man. Um, and I remember walking out of that when we ever do it, like a lot of people would laugh, of course, but then there was so many people mad at me, like, you know, women, how dare you? I had to take my kids. I bring my kids here. I'm like, <laughs> oh I'm thinking about those people now when they watch Rami in general, let alone this episode that I did. I mean, man, yeah, this show, Rami, I mean, you've been on dozens of TV shows and movies. And this one, I feel when I watched the first season with Jenna, I was like, okay, finally, there is a confident Arab, Muslim American spin on comedy, on sitcom, on, on sit, you know, it's amazing. It deals with everything. I was talking to someone yeah. today about the show and it's like, you know, a lot of people like when they watch it, they're like, oh my God, I didn't know, you know, like you feel like that, you have these problems. I'm like, well, what do you mean? You didn't, you didn't know that Arab people want to have sex ever since they, you know, puberty, that you didn't know that yeah. masturbate, like, you know, like <laughs> what is it you don't know? It's just like something that people are so afraid to talk about and they don't. And that's why people get upset because it's something we're not used to talking about. How dare you, you know? But like, yeah, my God, everyone. When I was 13, all I'm thinking about is when I'm going to have sex for the first time, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? And, and women the same. They think about the same thing. Yeah. Everyone, like all these problems about love and intimacy between parents and grownups, they're all the same. It's just people deal with them a little bit differently from one culture to the next. So it's like surprising to people. Oh, now when they see 
in my storyline, you know, it's like, how dare you? How dare you? Like, is that thing does not exist in the Middle East? I'm like, yeah, we're gonna do we're gonna do the spoiler. We're gonna do spoilers definitely. So beware, uh, cool. beware, audience. This is not a press junket where we're gonna tiptoe around the plot. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah, just gonna yeah. go for it. Yeah. <laughs> I also watched. Uh, I rewatched season one. I was in the U.S. actually, and I had my Jenna's brother and his wife were watching with me, and I felt that they were a bit shocked. They're they're very open minded and liberal, but they were also shocked and amazed and actually excited. Like we binged together every episode. We're like, oh yes, this is awesome. This content like brings together real life, real issues, sex and depression and you know existential shit with the Muslim, the Arab American experience in a way that's it's very raw, which is amazing. You know what I loved also? Something that I rewatched season two. I binged it first myself. And then when Jenna, I wanted to see it. I sat through most of it again with her. Is that there's this confidence with the plot and the punchlines. You're no longer trying to tiptoe around stereotypes about us Arabs and Muslims, that there's anti-Semitism and that there's misogyny and that there's the stereotype of the, of the aggressive or the, or the terrorist or all these things. There's so many stereotypes of us. Some of them are very common, like, like you know, having, having certain opinions about Jews, for example. You know. And, and the, the cool thing I found was that the show just slams straight into those. Like, it's unapologetic. No apologies. No apologies. No apologies. Yeah, 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 yeah. It keeps it, keep it real, you know. No tiptoeing around the issues. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, and the characters are not like, like the three dimensional, they're well drawn, you know. So there's, you know, it's so important to like, you're going to have like a character that's uh, like Uncle Nassim, you see in season one, he's anti Semitic, he's homophobic, at least that's, you know, he appears like that. But yet yeah, it's, it's really weird. Like all the people that you work with are Jews, yeah, you know. Exactly. He makes a living <laughs> working with Jews and yet he's, yeah. Yeah. You know, he's homophobic and then. We'll, you know, we'll get to that when we get to that. But at the same time, you see his humanity. I'm like, you hate him. You're like, oh my God. And then you go like, he reminds me of my fucking uncle. You know what I mean? I hate my uncle, he, but I love him because he's my uncle. You know, and there's some, like he gives me money. You know, I love him, but he's homophobic. He's a racist. I hate him, but I love him. You know, that's the kind of thing because then you see his humanity. You see when he goes, he stands up for that woman who was being assaulted by her boyfriend in, in season one, and he doesn't know from Adam, and he, because he believes it's not right. And that shows his humanity, you know? Like it or not, you get to see that. And it's really important because people tell me, oh, all the roles, you know, like uh, terrorists and this and that. But yeah, back in the day, you know, when they started out, you, you have a plan. I, had a, I laid out a plan, you know, like, okay, I'm gonna do these roles for this time because I need to get in the union, I need to do this and that, blah, 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 blah. And it grew to where I'm at right now. But like, if somebody came up to me right now and said, oh, I got this role for you as a terrorist, I'm like, okay. I, I won't say, no, I'm not gonna play it. I'm like, let me read it. I wanna see it. Let me see what, oh, he just goes in and he, he just kills people and says death to America. And then they go in, they chase him and they kill him. And there's a lot of action scenes like, no, I don't wanna do that. But if you're doing something interesting that's gonna make people understand what drives someone to do these acts, even though I don't agree with them, but I'm willing to explore that, to live through that. That's very different. But it's so easy in America. They don't write. Like if this show was produced by non-Arabs, written by non-Arabs, they could do it. They could have done it. They can find, you know, a few writers, put them in the writer's room, and they create something. It will be completely off. But everything will be like, hey, you know, it will be, it, there's no depth. It's not real. It'll be like uh, caricatures. Yeah, but yeah. here we are, you know, we have a person who's writing two issues. He's not afraid. He's not afraid of anything. He's not afraid of media. He's not afraid of the backlash. And yeah. he's very brave because also he has a family, you know, he has a, his parents, you know. It's so scary, you know, when you, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. do that. So yeah. I give it to Rami, man. He's like one of a kind. Yeah, time. yeah, he's, he's awesome. A lot of brave writing there. Like Uncle Nassim, when you said he's three-dimensional, yeah, and he, it's awesome, especially in these crazy times that we're living in, this Trump era, yeah. uh, and this, the polarization where you sometimes, maybe as progressives, we look at people who don't believe what we believe, and we're like, how can that person be okay with, like, let's say, a certain policy, like Trump or whatever? Yeah. 
and you kind of almost don't understand where they're coming from. And Uncle Nassim, your character, he has the good heart and he does care. Like you said, there's examples that he's a caring human being. At the same time, he'll ask Mahershala Ali's character, which prison did you convert in? You know? <laughs> And that's like, you cut straight, like a, like a non-Arab, like if you're not from the culture, you, you wouldn't dare say that, but you know that these, these Arab uncles think that way, you know, yeah. like, oh, this, uh, this, these black guys, these black Muslims, man, you know. Yeah, all going to convert in prison, you know. <laughs> oh my God. But also, it's a, a lot of it is about like, you know, miseducation too. Like we need to, yeah. we're, we're really not that as a people. Oh Yeah. People, we are educated people and smart and very progressive. Like we've, you know, we fucking invented math. You know, we're very smart people, right? But when it comes to world culture and all that stuff, we're not really cultured. We're not. No, we're, we're not very tolerant of different not very people. Progressive, we're not very tolerant. We, you know, even hence the way we refer to black people, for instance. You know what I mean? Which is something is on my long-term lifetime goal is to like yeah. eradicate those terms. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Use the Middle East because they're so derogatory and they're so upsetting. But it also comes from, you know, non-education. It comes from people also like they hear people talking a certain way or they do this and then they, or they hear, they, they learn from something from the media and they don't get the whole truth. They don't get yeah, to yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. They're not educated. It's almost that they're sheltered. You know what I mean? Exactly. So, it's funny. Both of us, you and I like moved to the U.S. as adults and I arrived in New York. I was 19 a few years before 9-11, and I had never had gay friends or Jewish friends. I had never met a gay or Jewish person in my entire life. And thankfully for a bit of, uh, you know, TV back then, you kind of understand that humans are humans, but you're still not there yet. Once you really befriend people from different cultures, it, it sets an example for you that we're all human. Even if I never met like an Indonesian uh, farmer, uh, now that I've, you know, now that I've, I'll be less likely to be racist towards them or stereotype them in a certain way. And when you, like you said, when, when we come from a sheltered place, it's very hard to get everybody on par with accepting and being tolerant with everyone else. I mean, here in Jordan, I mean, the Arab world is very prejudiced against foreigners. You know, my uncle lived in Egypt for like five years and he was shocked at how Egyptian elites treat other Arabs like they're shit, for example, for some weird psychological reason. They think that they're like uh, elite above everybody else. In Jordan, there was a survey a few years ago that asked people, if your neighbor was Indian or something, would you, or would you mind to have an Indian neighbor in your building? And the number of people that said I would mind is like above 50% it was some some sick number and they're like dude who, who do you think you are you know? <laughs> you, know, you know but you know what it is I'm at uh, but so worry I didn't know and hell I you know maybe our generation can start it but it's the younger generations they're gonna evolve hopefully they're evolving and they're changing you know and and they will eventually the world will have to adapt and change because otherwise it's going to crumble. You know what I mean? What's happening yeah. now in America is incredible. And it's everything that we relate to. I just talked to, you know, I talk about it a lot and I'm kind of involved in what's happening, not just because I think it's important for black people and people of color, but it's also important for me. I am, we are people of color too. We consider it here, you know, yeah. we're like Muslims, you know, Arab yeah. Muslim, forget about it. Like every time you just, you just add one thing to the, you know, like first we came, when I first came to America, it was so funny. We were, when I first came to America, I was like, everyone knew, like, there was no such term as Arabs. It was like Palestinians. Like, because every, everyone knew Arabs were the ones who were fighting with Israelis, and they were the terrorists. Palestinians were terrorists, you know what I mean? <laughs> and then we started evolving a little bit, you know, they started no more. Then 9-11 happened, and then there was more of a distinction, you know? Then there was, like, Arabs from all these other countries. And then ISIS came, and it became Muslims. It became, there's all these distorted ideas of who we are you know what i mean yeah. and everything that's changing now in america and hopefully the world is really good for everyone and eventually it's going to spread there's a generation that's going to spread that all over the world the arab world and everyone you know when shows like maybe five years ago no one will ever show rami in the middle east and now they're showing rami in the middle east i won't say detail but i'm getting incredible response from the middle east messages from people i don't know they're telling me like we just saw your episode and it's changing my life thank you i mean amazing gets me so emotional and makes me yeah. so you know it's a good thing to push people to think about equality and and justice and just tolerating 
I love what you've been saying. I saw your Instagram posts, your video monologues. They're amazing. And you reminded me of, you know, we as Arabs in America, I mean, I left America a decade ago, but um, I was there during 9-11 in New York City. And Mm -hmm. I heard your 9-11 story and and what you went through with even changing your name at one point because of of certain series, because somebody Mm -hmm. said, oh, Syrians are terrorists, and you kind of didn't want to to feel that way. No, that was the first thing. When I first came to America, I changed. That was before 9-11, right. 9-11 made me kind of get actually more active. I was very reactive to it and I was, became late and I became Syrian. I became, yeah. I don't say I'm British, I'm British. I just avoid the conversation, you know what I mean? And uh, avoid instead of facing it. But then I became like late from Syria, you know? We have to look in, within our communities because, yeah, just because we are victims of racism and all that doesn't mean that we're not racist. There's a lot of people who are, <laughs> who are racist in our communities, a lot of other minority communities. So. This is also like trying to educate them, not just like white people. Or, or, you know. I always believe in putting ourselves in someone's shoes. If some older person is racist, but he's kind, he's just like, he's, he just reacts a certain way to, let's say, if he's white to black people, if he reacts a certain way, not necessarily something we can eradicate in his generation. Like you said, next generation, yeah. it can be, can be slow. But for me, like when, before George Floyd's incident, there was another tragic incident that was on the news from Georgia, where I think it's Ahmad Arbery. Yeah. And when you hear how the police responded, and before the story blew up, you can imagine the white police and the two white you know, murderers that got him killed for no reason. Having lived in the U.S., I imagine what they're thinking among themselves. They're thinking, okay, those two white guys, you know, they're, they're, they're from a suburb. They're law-abiding citizens. They're America. You know, they represent America. They love the Second Amendment. They have their guns. There's all these stereotypes of the suburban white person. And then the white cop comes in, and the law is supposed to make him, okay, now you white suburban American, you killed that black guy for no reason. You're a killer. Now I'm supposed to destroy your life. You're supposed to be punished. You're going to be put in jail and we're going to take away we're going to take away everything from you now because you killed somebody that's what's supposed to happen when you just murder somebody your life is pretty much over you're going yeah. to be taken away that's how a society should work but to these white cops when they look at the situation they're like uh that's just a black guy and these are two upstanding white citizens yeah. they don't have it in them like I, I i you know i met enough americans that aren't really woke enough or like they're not really aware of how racist that feeling is that's deep inside because i see it here as well and it's by the way it's not just race it's also class yeah yeah you know? of course. a rich person coming out of his mercedes will be treated differently if he ran over a kid than like a homeless guy living in his car who ran over a kid almost all over the world by the way and that kind of police uh, bias mm-hmm. is not just racial it's class as well because it's, they're kind of linked i feel Part of the racism against black people in America, even from immigrants, like, you know, the typical Korean, like, deli convenience store owner. It's been a punchline in comedy and TV, like, for decades, that the Korean, you know, deli guy hates the black guy who comes into his store and follows him around. You know, that's, like, been a yeah, yeah. You know, that stereotype. Yeah. I agree with you. I mean, you know, first of all, I don't think we even need to use the word, like, ruin someone's life or kill someone. They don't deserve to have a life. Justice should be served. And the last thing I would think about, like, oh, well, now we're going to ruin your life. No, you should not have a life. You do not belong here. You know what I mean? And yeah, there's that shield that goes up right away. You know, it's a completely different shield. It's like, you know, you you can watch videos of how it's something like it's almost like a subconscious feeling of how you treat someone else who's not a color because you automatically in your body, you feel a threat no matter what you feel a wrong movement is, you know, but then there could be someone else who is branding a machete, you know, and then you're like, tase him or you just try to calm him down and this and that there's a lot of evidence of that and i think the problem is like i have a lot of friends who are cops and they're really actually good people but um that's not enough because you know there's certain industries and certain industries that we're in for instance and there's certain professions that you can't afford you can't be 99.9 even you know you have to be 100 percent or not because some comedian was saying you can't be an airline and say well you know how your pilot say well you know 99% 99% of them are really, really good. <laughs> what about that fucking 1%? What do you mean? So you can't. So it's something that has to change. You know, it has to change. And I'll tell you, there's a story that I'm going to share. Um, 
because I try to tell my stories. I don't try to, one day maybe I'll tell my stories and I, you know, I, I do intend to tell them in detail because they pertain to me. But right now when I'm telling these stories, I'm trying to just shed a spotlight on the disparity and on the difference and relate them to the black experience. And I remember there's one story in 2009, I was, there's a video on it online too, like somewhere. And it was late at night. I was in Midtown, right by Macy's. I got on the train and all of a sudden down the station, I heard screams, women screaming. And I ran and I saw this, this black man, he was on the tracks. He was like uh, uh, unconscious, uh, like just moving and trying to get up, but he couldn't. And his head was on one side of the rail and it was like blood was just shooting out of his head. And I'm looking around, you know, and I don't see anything yet on 42nd Street, the lights. We come down, I jump in and then two other guys come in. We help him, we save him. The police come, paramedics come, they patch him up and they take him. And I left, I didn't wait for any media, anything like that or whatever, I just left. Nobody came anyway. And I was like, you know, I said, oh, maybe they'll, they'll talk about it on the news. They didn't talk about it on the news. I called, I called the hospital, I called the police precinct so many times to check, is he okay, is he alive, blah, blah, blah. And it took me quite some time before I got, you know, they sent me a copy of the report and what happened. And they said, oh yeah, yeah, he was released. You know, they, he was released, he was, you know, he was a homeless guy. And not even a few days later, there was a, a white woman. Uh, she fell on the tracks in Queens and somebody pulled her up and everything like that. It was all over the news, you know? It was all over the news. And uh, <laughs> the guy who, who saved her uh, was hailed as a hero and all that stuff. So, you know, there you have it. If that guy was, you know, um, even it comes to class, you know, like even within, within race, there are different classes too, yeah. you know? And that's the reality of what's happening, so. It is. It's sad that America is very guilty of this type of society. The world I mean, can change and it will change. We have to do our part. And if we all do our part slowly, you know, I think something will happen. I can contribute as an artist and having a voice. I felt like my whole life I've been, all I wanted to be is be an artist to have a voice. And I feel like right now I'm finally having a voice. I'm talking to you and maybe 10 people or 100 people will watch this and say, learn something that's a success. Yeah, I saw you posted about, I think, Arab Americans, Black Lives Matter, Arab Americans, some yeah, kind of... Maytel Hassan, she's Syrian American and she's heavily involved in the Black Freedom Movement and the Black Lives Matter Movement, heavily involved. And, and she was one of the writers also on Rami. Yeah. She reached out to me and, and, and got involved and it's all incredible, man. And hopefully the right side of history, you know? Yeah. Yeah, any justice, that's all, we, that's all we ask for, is for, for justice. Justice for everyone. It's a complicated but yet simple request. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a simple, it's, it is. I mean, it's... Man. Yeah. The world has, uh, has changed, Yani. When I was watching Rami, you know, in my, in my 20s, I was an activist at first for Palestine. You know, you're very passionate, very young. And I'm, my father's Palestinian and we lost a lot of shit over there. So, and, and we still suffer, Yanni, till this day. And after that, I became, in my late 20s, I became like a militant atheist in my 20s after I was a activist. But back then, the world, the media, the content, well, there wasn't much out there. I grew up as a Muslim, of course, mm -hmm. and... In my 30s, I became more spiritual. I don't longer care if there's a God or there isn't a God. It doesn't matter. To me. It's about what you do and how you conduct yourself. So, mm -hmm. you know, and nobody can prove anything anyway. <laughs> but in uh, Rami, what I loved, you guys are not treating like Islam with kid gloves. You're basically like that scene with Omar Mitwelli's character drinking the porn star Mia Khalifa's breast milk. Oh my God, I bet every Arab in the world will laugh at that. Come on. Come that on. is insane. I mean, you're bringing in Mia Khalifa, yeah. okay, as, uh, in, in, your, in the punchline, and you're bringing in the, the insane notion that if you drink a woman's milk, then she becomes like your mother or some shit. I have like about like 10 great uncles by, you know, but you know, the same way, you know, so oh my God. Uh, it's like, I just laughed in that moment when Rami drinks it, just that moment that the, the, the nuance and when he just sips, it's like so incredible, so detailed. It's so beautiful. Oh man. my God. That is beautiful. Especially since it's been set up that he's been hooked. He's been hooked on porn yeah, yeah, for a long great. time. Now he's drinking Mia Khalifa's like breast milk. So he can't even like, she is haram to him now. Yeah, <laughs> come on, come on. It's so, I mean, it's 
in theory, like, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's right. Like based on like certain uh, beliefs, whatever. Yeah. You know, you're related. So it's, it's great. It worked out so good. Man. Oh man. Yeah. That's, that is amazing. But look, people can refer to it whatever they want. They can refer to it, the Muslim show, whatever. Americans going to call it, yeah, the Muslim show. And some people will say, oh, it's a show about Islam. It's really not. It's not representative of, all of Islam. It's not, nobody's trying to explain Islam. It's like there's a boy on the spiritual journey trying to find himself and, and trying to find the balance between his desires and his faith. And he just keeps on falling in shit all the time. He just can't seem to get himself out. Just when he does, he just, boom, falls into another, you know. So while the issues of Islam in it are nothing in it is offensive, they're all true. They're all truthful, you know, from the, the moment they pray to, the, to everything else. But it's not a show trying to explain Islam. There's a million stories, you know. Yeah, and yeah exactly. Stories. If anyone can take a story and they can tackle it, I think this show has opened up the doors for many people to write and create and tell their stories. And that's what people should do. And not look at it as this is like, oh, this show does not represent Islam. And he didn't write it to say all, you know, millennials like him are the same. No, it's, this is just one person. These are his parents and this is his uncle. Some people will relate and others will not. And that's it. It's really that simple in the end. It's like saying, you know, entourage is representative of every like, Hollywood, Hollywood one. No, no it's not. No, it happens. <laughs> I've seen it. I've known people. But then for the most yeah. part, all my friends, they, they don't have entourages. But it feels like Rami's buddies are his entourage. That's right. You know, right. it's almost like the same dynamic. They're just, you know. They're on the show. And they're on the show. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Another fun uh, scene that I'm sure some conservatives will be offended by is the, it's virtual, the, hajj. the virtual hajj thing is yeah. awesome. It's classic. This is insane. You yeah, know? and you saw how much it meant to him, like to Mo. I mean, he was in it, man. I was like, I believe that he was... He was as emotional as he was over there. Like he was experiencing it. And it was so beautiful. Yeah, watch. he's like, oh, the Kaaba, the like, he, oh, but man. He breaks down and cries. It's so beautiful. And, the, you know, the scene with Steve, you know, like. The jerking off. That's a beautiful scene about friendship. It's like that scene always leaves me. I've, I've watched it so many times. It leaves me in tears because look at how beautiful this is. What friends would do for each other. Even go to that extreme. Even go to that extreme. That's like, what would I do for my friend if that was if that was me? My it's a metaphor for how far you'll go, you know. How far you'll go, yeah. So, and you know, people just they look at they won't look at the loneliness aspect. They won't look at the pain, and they won't relate to it, even if they're not dealing with the same issue. Because anyone living with a deep secret that you cannot talk about, tell a person, it causes so much internal pain, and that pain manifests in so many different ways. Whether it's you become mean, whether it's you eat, whether it is you become anti what you are, whether you spend money, you gamble, whatever it is you do, you find a form of release for that pain because you're not able to share it or come to terms with it. And that's what it's about in general, you know what I mean? But then it's specific to his pain. Yeah. You know what's also, uh, what's great about the show is this format of where you get your own episode. The sister gets one. She's awesome. The mom, the dad. Yeah. And then you have, towards the end, I think it was before the finale, yeah. the Uncle Nassim's episode. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I, I didn't see it coming for our audience and our listeners. Spoiler, obviously. The episode at the beginning, you're at the gym, mm -hmm. and then, boom, you're getting head from a friend in the steam room. Mm -hmm. And that's it. <laughs> that's the moment where people, like, you know, they're drinking something, they choke on it, or they, like, you know. <laughs> Some people might throw their shahata at the TV. Yeah. No, Uncle Nassim. Oh, I got this one message. Uh, it'd be so cool if he ever watches this. He was a big fan of mine from season one. He was telling me, you know, anything that's positive, anything that's nice, I respond. You know, I don't care how many I get. I'll find the time to say something to acknowledge that. Thank you. You know what I mean? So with him, I've been, you know, responded to them a few times, you know. Um, and... <laughs> And calls me, I'm going to see him. And then this year, he said something like, I can't wait for season two. I'm like, okay, great. And then Friday morning on the premiere day, of course, it aired at midnight. There's some people who waited and binged it. So by the time I woke up, there are already messages and people who've seen it. And he, he sends his message. It was <laughs> so funny. He goes, I just watched episode nine. I don't like you anymore. <laughs> Man, how does that feel? That one, it was like, I felt like it was a little boy who, you know, just doesn't understand. And he's like, it wasn't mean-spirited. It comes from something 
someone who's not educated yet, who's someone who's so young who's not doesn't understand it. You know what I mean? That's my feeling. I mean, there are other ones that were like really mean. I just documented them, and one day maybe I'll I'll share them all together. <laughs> but um, some of them are really mean. Been called things that I've never been called in my life. So wow. Do- and uh, in so, private messages no some of them were like on po- comments on the on on things i you know i block them because they're just so distasteful they're not even a conversation because sometimes people will have a conversation will say something like one person said something i think like uh, i was very uncomfortable but you were very good but i know it's okay because you were just acting i'm like well that doesn't make it okay what you're saying like me saying that you know what it's okay i'm acting don't worry about it i'm not gay like, what if I were gay? Like, do you have an issue with that? I mean, what does that mean? It's okay, you're just acting. So things like that, that I can maybe have a conversation, like with someone I, you know, I had a conversation with someone because it said, I have to be honest, I love season one. I like the season, it's well done, but it just made me feel very uncomfortable. And I'm like, that's okay. The show's yeah. supposed to make you feel uncomfortable because when you feel uncomfortable, then you open up to learn. You open up to educate yourself and to understand and be more empathetic. That means we achieved the goal. And then there's so much love, man, and so much funny love, and it's great. (laughs) Man, yeah, that episode. It's heartbreaking, though. Well, it's sad. I mean, it's funny. Yeah, it's funny because just Uncle Nassim is funny because the way, what the things he says, and and he's so committed to them. Way, deadpan. He doesn't try to be funny. The line, one of my favorite ones was the one about like, I'm sure he's in heaven if you have that in Mexico. You know, it was like one of the funniest things yeah. you can do. Like I would break up right after because it was just so honest. Because here you have an intense scene. It's so intense, you know. <laughs> yet you laugh. But the whole episode is really sad in him because it's all about his loneliness. And you got to understand all the little nuggets that are in the first season. Like the wife leaving him. Why she left. His homophobia. His relationship to Dina. All that stuff. And his pain because really he wants to... That's his truth, but he doesn't know how to reconcile with it. It feels like he can. He stops himself, you know, and in the end, he feels like, okay, I want to do this. He wants to do it. He's there. Why is he there? He wants to connect with this person. He doesn't want to just get a, a blowjob in the steam room and not talk to someone. He wants to start being intimate, you know what I mean? And then, boom, he just can't handle it. He just can't because whatever it is that's stopping him gets in the way. And that's very truthful. It's very real. It happens to a lot of people. And Did you carry that knowledge that uh, Uncle Nassim is closeted gay in season one? No. As an actor, yeah. I did not. I did not. But but all these little nuggets that were in there, they just worked. It was just like a pure, here's the thing. Here's the brilliance of Rami. What happened was I came up to Rami one time and I said, you know, Rami had this great idea. What if, you know, Uncle Nassim, you know, struggling with his sexuality, he wants to, Maybe he's gay, he wants to come out, and he's struggling with it. And he laughed. He said, (laughs) yeah, we've been talking about that all along. It's been part of the plan. It's been discussed in the room. So, yeah, maybe it did influence season one. He knew about it. I didn't know about it because it's just so perfect. It lines up with everything. So, you know, he's a genius, and I give it to him for doing that. In season one, like, I don't know why I had a feeling that I just wanted it to be, because he's so machismo, you know, and I wanted to bring in part of my own late truth into it and that's when i said we brought up the line like i was mr egypt runner up you know so we improvised that and they kept it and because i knew that we would want to find a way to bring it up in season two i always had a dream i don't care what context is to do a workout montage you know what i mean (laughs) you know because that's what i did before you know in my 20s i was a bodybuilding champion i was mr syria and i was competing here and i was going to do the world championships and then I, you know, I quit because I was not happy and I pursued acting. So, but now I feel like, oh my God, all those years of training, it was worth it just for this, that one fucking uh, montage, you know, my Rocky montage. Man, that's (laughs) nice. Oh yeah. Those pictures on the wall, those are mine. No way. Bodybuilding pictures were mine. We just like, you know. No way. Yeah, yeah. We just photoshopped, you know, with all the, you know, and stuff like that. But those are mine. Those are all my pictures. Oh, man. That's amazing. Wow. Were you bulkier than in season one? 
Um, Season two? Weight-wise, I've always been like, you know, since I lost that vanity factor of uh, my mind, I'm like, you know what? I spent my whole 20s with a six-pack and worrying about how I look and having a hairless body and like people like looking at me and me bouncing my pecs. And then uh, when I'm in my 30s, I'm like, I started like, I don't give a shit anymore. If people don't like me for who I am, I don't want anyone to like me because I look hot, you know, or my body looks good. So I started having, you know, my 40s like a dad bod. So I'm like, <laughs> and I'm fit. I'm, I'm more fit than the average guy in his 40s, right? And um, I don't go to the gym as often as I did. But when I knew I was going to do that, I got back in the gym. And I just, all, it's muscle memory. All I have to do is train and my muscles do just boom. So I trained really hard for a couple months before that. Of course, in the gym before every scene, I would just pump <laughs> up. You know? So that's why I looked like just so pumped. Yeah. You tried to rekindle an old flame in episode nine with, uh, with Walid Zaitir's gag. That storyline is going to be really explored in season two. Nice. It's like the chemistry with me and Walid, my God, it's like, a, it's like a dream, man. I love that guy. He's the first guy I met who was like Arab. I didn't think that Arab actors existed and I met him at an audition and he's the one who guided me to the comedy festival. In New York, right? New York City. Wow, those days, man. After 9-11... The energy of the Arab American acting community started building and building and building. Yeah. I could trace back maybe half of the Arab American actors today to that bubble in New York City. Yeah, most of us started in New York, you know, and then, yeah, it was nice. It was nice. I mean, the comedy festival was not like, it was a celebration just for other Arabs. Yeah. It was for them to come and have a laugh. It wasn't really, it didn't give us exposure. It didn't really change our lives. It was like, literally, like, we do that to celebrate our community with our community. You know what I mean? And they will come, they'll have a laugh to relate to, and it was great. And also we get some practice and work on our chops, you know? So it was kind of nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. I'm so glad you like the show. I hope a lot of people like it. It's amazing. It's a one of a kind. It's not your typical show. It's hard to find something like it. Especially people who know the Middle East, who know Arab or Muslim culture will really dig it. Yeah, the hardest thing to do in TV Hardest thing is, like, sometimes it's the worst thing to have a hit show, the hit first season, because you get to have the biggest problem ever, season two, because you can have a shitty season three, four, five, six, could be shit, but you won't have those shits if you don't have a very good season two. You need to have a very good season two. The moment it's not, then the show's going to get canceled and stuff. So it's very hard to top first season. First season was groundbreaking. But boy, did he top it, man. He topped it in in a half. It's It's amazing. Absolutely. Season two knocked it out of the park. I'm so happy. I didn't have a doubt when I started watching. Sometimes you're like, oh, can we really relive this kind of uh, amazing moment of hilarity and like also depth at the same time and the great punchlines all at the same time? And it happened and it was insane. And it was so deep. I mean, it was so elevated. Uh, my God, heartbreaking the end. We all relate to it because it's kind of like, you know, that moment when we're fighting and um, fighting for our rights as the Arabs and as Muslims or trying to tell the world that we're not terrorists. And then some asshole goes and blows himself up and kills 20 people. And you're like, God damn it. Here we are. He's talking about like how peaceful Islam is. And then this guy does this thing that is like so anti-Islam, you know, but he's doing it under the guise of thinking he's doing a good thing, right? Yeah, it's so real. It's coming from a passionate place. It's coming from like, how dare you say this? This is like peaceful religion. And then he goes, he beats the shit out of him, actually kills him, ends up killing him. And that's like a tough thing to like navigate. And he did it. And it's beautiful, man. It's so, and yet you make it funny. How do you make something that's really, really deep and everything funny? That's like, that's a trick. It's so hard. You need to take any scene here that is, that even every scene that makes you cry, it will make you laugh at the same time. It's honest, it's very brave, and it's very heartfelt. You can't fail with that kind of heart that goes into it. It's amazing. I'm confident there's so much more coming. (laughs) I mean, season three is booked already, correct? They haven't announced it yet, but I have a feeling they will. From a business sense, you know, Hulu and all those streaming platforms. And it's streaming all over the world. I mean, the first season streaming all over the world. So I'm sure they're making profit. Trust yeah, me, nobody yeah, makes yeah. anything in America without profit. Yeah, yeah, a, yeah. Nobody makes something because, oh, it's good, I want to make it. They have to make money. Maybe sometimes not a lot, but they have to make money for them to... Yeah, yeah, it. it's capitalism. And over here, where the network OSN, it's called, mm-hmm. they're milking it. The show is like their uh, 
Yeah, I heard, I heard my promos on there all the time. My, oh, yeah, yeah, big time. My sister's over there, too. They're using it to keep their subscribers. Yeah, so it's a successful show. I to get good residuals. <laughs> I'm getting a lot of messages from my uh, Syrian actors in, in Dubai, and they're, you know, they're, like, so much support and love, like, Hussein, uh, Khuli, and, you know, the screen talkish, and Adham Murshid. Adam Murshid, Rami loves him, so Rami's, like, calls me, he's like, where's Adam? Because Adam is very funny. He's a Syrian actor, a Syrian American, but mostly like works in Syria. I mean, he wrote that. You know that song where Yamuru will be a Taifua? It's a song that was for a TV show. Then it became like very uh, top singer in the world, like an Arab world was singing it. And so Adam was like in Dubai. You know, he's working on a TV show there, and and Rami goes like, "Where's Adam? Like he's in Dubai." I'm like, oh, I want him to play this part. You know, I think it'll be perfect for it. I'm like, okay. I'm like, I said, I called Adam. I'm like, listen, Adam, Rami wants you to play this part. And he has no ego about it. He knows the difference between, like, you can be a star in the Middle East, you can come here, it means nothing. It means nothing in America. Unless you have a crossover project, it means zero. So Adam goes, like, he read the scene, he's like, yeah, I'll be there. I'll be, you know, and he, <laughs> he got on a plane, on a, like, on a Tuesday, I think shot on a Wednesday, and then left back on a Thursday. And I think it cost him more than what he got paid. Luckily, he got paid overtime. I think it paid for everything. <laughs> but he played the Egyptian concierge in episode 10. In the beginning oh, of the episode? Oh, yes, yes, yes. The, the throwback to the Cairo. Yeah, yeah, when he goes into the room, you know, like, you know, who's that woman with you? You know what I mean? I mean it, it, that was at home, yeah. So, so, like, so that's Rami, too. Like, Rami, what's so great, he just loves to give back, too. He'll cast, if you're good, he'll just give people chances, give them breaks. And you know how hard it is here. You wait freaking sometimes five years to get your first job where you say, here's the coffee, sir. There you go. If you're, like, lying and you sitting with your family of 30 people to watch your debut and that's your debut you know and that's how important <laughs> yeah it's amazing <laughs> you know I mean? my debut was like my first line and, and my friend had a big party for me i was on a tv show for two episodes and we're watching and, and we're all gathered and it's like crazy and it's on and my first line was like oh what fun it was so funny <laughs> <laughs> then I'm screaming and I'm killing people and then I'm dying and then like, you know, that was my debut and I had like 30 people watching. <laughs> what show was that? It was Third Watch. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, man. Man, those days. Uh, well, like, yeah, man, you guys come a long way. It's awesome. Last show I did, I had to like, I kept on saying no, 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 no. In principle, I just don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. I don't want to. And then, you know, I was working with my agent who was a very good guy. He told me later. You have to say yes to certain things just so we can build like, okay, now you have a recurring and you can also make some money. So I finally went into the show for 24, right? Mm -hmm. you know, show 24, right? Oh yeah. So I went in for that show. The breakdown was like the guy was from Malaysia or something. So anyway, I booked it. It was six episodes, a lot of money and a recurring guest star. And I'm like, okay, you know what? Frick it. It's the Jack Bauer action. Yeah, yeah but it was the reincarnation. Corey Hawkins, they did a, you know, okay. the main guy, the black guy. Right, and it was a wonderful guy. Also, coincidentally, a friend of mine. So I went to move to Atlanta, started shooting, and I'm talking in the in the casting office at Fox. I remember I told them, I "Just want to let you know that should this work out and I get cast, they need to really change the name because the name is like really not an Arab name. It's very offensive." And I said, "Yeah, well, you know, hopefully, you know, you talk to them about it." And then when I got to Atlanta, I got to the set, met the producers, I said the same concern, I said, oh, "Yeah, yeah, okay, we'll look into it." Then. I said, email the writers. I emailed the writers and, and nobody would change it. They wouldn't change it. And I'm like, they wouldn't fucking change the name. And I'm like, listen, guys, this is like most offensive. Like, you know, I hear stories that back in the day in Damascus, like in my old city, like, you know, people kill people because they get called this word and then they can use that as their defense in, in court. It goes way back in history. That's how strong this word is. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, 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 nothing. And then by episode four, I'm like, okay, well, at least they didn't say my name in the show. And of course, by episode four, I just said that and they started calling me by the name in the show. And you can ask me now, what's the name? <laughs> what is it? What was, the, what was the word? And the name is, the name is, and I'm sorry to every, all my uh, Arab brothers and sisters that you have to hear this, but the name is Kusuma. 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 Like, I, no matter how, what version you try to say it, it sounds yeah. bad. Like, you say Kusuma. 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 Whatever version of it you say, it. no matter how you say it, you say it bad. You say it fast, right? Say, you know, because I couldn't coach the other people. Like, try to say, try to mumble it. Say Kusuma. They can't. They say like Kusuma, you know, in the show. And then you look at my IMDb. It says 
Kusuma. I'm checking it right now. Yeah, Kusuma. Can you please look at it right now? Yeah, yeah. it says Kusuma, the character name. <laughs> hey, what is that? Is that a, you said it was a Malaysian act, no, character? No, maybe they Googled it or something, but that was the last thing I did. I got off of things after that. No, 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 no. Even Homeland. I didn't go in for it. Many times they were called. And that's the importance of Rami. Because Rami's not going to Google things and copy and paste. And for them, these characters serve a purpose. Their purpose is to be bad and to get killed. And how they get killed. That's all it is. They have no depth. Every now and then, something, they'll show some depth to something, to someone. But it doesn't matter. Like, I did another movie. I did a huge Hollywood film called 12 Strong. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a great experience. Got to learn how to ride a horse and... You know, it was my first big Hollywood thing. Made a lot of money and, you know, it was good to put that on the resume. I had some nice scenes. And when we were doing it, the director would say, like, there would be a scene where on horses, we're shooting our guns and blah, blah, blah. There's wars on it. And he was like, just say something. Say something in Arabic. Well, first of all, it's Arabic. It's not Arabic. And second <laughs> of all, we're not in the Middle East. We're in Afghanistan. They speak, we're not in an Arab country. We don't speak Arabic here. We're in Afghanistan. They speak, you know, uh, Pashtun, Urdu, whatever other language they do speak in that region. They're all rebels, so maybe they speak different languages, but yeah, I promise yeah. you, they don't speak Arabic. So I'm not going to say something in Arabic. And that's like a $60 million movie that they wouldn't care to get these little details right. Yeah, we see it all the time. And we try to get it right. We try to get it right. Like there was one movie they wanted me to go in for, and there was like a scene five pages in Farsi. I'm like, no, there's a lot of good actors that speak Farsi. And if I had two lines, I'll perfect it. I'll do it. You know what I mean? No problem. But why? Why do I want to be offensive to someone else and then not be authentic? I'm not going to do it. Same thing when I see somebody going, Anna, Anna, it's me. I'm an al-watan al-arabi. Anna, fuck Allah. Anna, so fa'uqatilu hatta al-abad. You know, why? Why? I can just top of my head right now give you 10 good Arab American actors for any category that you tell me from 18 to 60. I can tell you, give you 10 names here. Check these people out. So hopefully it's changing, man. It's yeah, it is. It is changing. But like you said, those big budget movies and even a show like Homeland, I remember Jenna and I started watching it many, many years ago. And we stopped watching it the moment there was, I think it was opening of season two. And yeah. there was a scene in Beirut. It said Beirut yeah. at the bottom. And the scene was desert. Mm -hmm. And it was a row of shops and the people were all wearing abayas with mm. turbans, with dust. And they were screaming. There was nobody that had a regular tone of voice. Everybody was just like screaming and running. And it said Beirut. I'm like, Jenna, my, oh my God. This is not that I'm offended. I don't give a shit. I know it's not personal. But my intelligence has been insulted to the point where I'm not going to enjoy. And we actually stopped. And then they made like six more seasons. And I missed all of those. You know, like I used to get hired a lot on TV shows to do Arabic translations to make sure they're saying everything right and authentic. And a lot of them were, uh, even if like they hired you, let's say, Imad, and you're doing your lines and you know how to speak Arabic, they still keep me all day long to make sure that you say it right. And because they don't want you to homeland the show. Basically what happened, I don't know if you heard what happened. No? Oh, the graffiti? Yeah, yeah, so the show premiered. It was like the funniest thing ever. I was on Batiha. Like I noticed that I'm watching, I'm like, wait a minute, what's the... So they got a taste of their own medicine, you know what I mean? So ever yeah. since then, everyone's so careful, you know, they want to hold one person responsible for it. So uh, <laughs> they got a taste of their own medicine. Man, yeah. that's amazing. So, do you live in New York, right? Which part of Union Square. Oh, nice. Right in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. My good friend Hadi, who's a doctor in Midtown, he lives off Union Square as well. Today, he sent us pictures around Union Square of just things boarded up. Have you been walking around? boarded up, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, it's all boarded up. You go up six, seven years, all boarded up. Is that before they got smashed or to prevent them from getting smashed? I mean, some things were getting smashed and then so everyone started just boarding things up out of precaution. I don't think there has been anything really since the first few days. And I don't want to speak for the, you know, but you know what, in the end, I really don't. I don't care as long as nobody gets hurt. Um, seems like little mom and pop shops are being spared. Uh, it would be wrong for Americans not to get upset and not to go nuts after seeing the George Floyd tragedy and murder. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's uh, the hair that broke the camel's back. The camel's been, has had herniations for like centuries, you know what I mean? He's, yeah. he's living with herniations, hernias, you know? That's what like 
finally broke his back. But it's been happening for a long time. And even now, there's like a lot of the responses are not good. Like, because I don't understand, you know, okay, why was this idiot? Like, okay, this idiot had his knee on George Floyd's neck, right? And they're like several people filming and he knows they're filming, right? And the reason you would think like he would remove his knee right away, right? Yeah. Try to do something different. Yet he didn't. And that is part of, I think, the white privilege problem because he knows that the law is with him. He knows that he's the law. He knows that no one's above him, that he can get exonerated. But little did he know that this was going to happen, that the world was going to change for him and everyone who attempts to do the same thing. Like, we can't afford to have a bad... I'm a big supporter in general of, you know, we need the security, we need uh, law enforcement, you know what I mean? But we need good ones, and that's my thing. Listen, I, I'm not going to talk about my run-ins, you know? I mean, I'm Arab. I live with a guilty conscience. I walk around thinking I've done something wrong. I have sides. I have sides I carry. If you catch me in the street anytime with my man bag, I have sides in there. So if I feel threatened, if I feel like... I'm walking, especially when I have a big beard, you know, I just shaved it. If I'm walking in front of cops and walking, I just pull out my sides and pretend I'm reading lines because people know in New York, if they see the highlighted lines, they know that guy's an actor. I just do it so I don't look guilty. And that comes from fear. Um, I can only imagine what it's like being black. It's crazy. We need to eradicate fear in these situations and um, we shouldn't be living in a culture of fear. Yeah, yeah, it's it's sad, man. I'm glad that you're hopeful. I'm glad that you're... Yeah, I can only be hopeful. I mean, yeah. what's the alternative? You can say, well, a lot of people go like, oh, yeah, well, this will fizzle out. This has been happened many times. I'm like, no, 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 this has never happened. What's happening now has never happened. Like, yeah. yeah, it's easy to get discouraged because with the gun laws issues in the last right. couple of years... Very little has happened to quell gun violence by actually limiting or doing more background checks. A lot of times nothing happens. And then you just wait till the next mass shooting happens. But this feels different, even though the school shooting in Florida did cause a lot of protest. Yeah. Um, but still, it's not enough. So we could be discouraged and think, oh, man, in a couple of weeks, this is going to die down and nothing's going to change. But the work that we all do should yeah. keep going. I think what's happening right now, they're laying down all, like they're building the, you know, when you build a building, you have to dig and dig and dig and dig and dig and dig and pour that cement base is going to hold the building. And that's what's being built right now. That base right now is being built. And then they're going to go into changing legislation, uh, politicians and policies and everything, you know, it's going to be big. And it's not going to be like, change a few laws and to like satisfy people that this is bigger than all that. And hopefully it'll spill into just the elections and all that stuff too. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Well, man, I'm, uh, it's so it, was, nice. it was awesome talking to you late. Really, really awesome. And, uh, one thing before I forget, I would love to post up on the YouTube version of this, any old clips or photos from the Arab American comedy festival from like 17 years back. No, I'll send you some. If you find I'll some, you some. I'll send you bodybuilding pictures too. Hey, hey. لما يوجع الجدار مان هاخد شو كف شغل بانكس يا حملو كل وجبتك سنهاي ساعة